Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum. Greetings of peace. Welcome to the DJ Shah Media host. And my next guest was traveling. And she wasn't traveling to France. She wasn't traveling to Italy, Bosnia, America. She was traveling to Afghanistan. And she actually didn't have a visa. She snuck in the country. And then she got captured. What happened to her next? Well, she's here on the Dean Show to share her story. The Dean Show. <laughs> this is the Dean. This is the Dean Show. 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 Our next guest, Yvonne Ridley. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Gosh, when I listened to that, I thought she must be barking mad. <laughs> Yeah, I hit it. So you didn't have a visa, actually, to get in the country. I did try. You know, I'm a lawful uh, citizen, and I did try and get a visa. I tried three times, but uh, the then spiritual leader of the Taliban had ordered all of the media out of the country, and um, they uh, refused me three times. Mm -hmm. Well, most people are traveling to different locations, uh for vacation, but what brought you to, at that time, you know, bombs are going off, bullets are flying, and you're sneaking in the country. I was after a story. Um, I was the chief reporter of the Sunday Express. There were 3,000 other journalists assembled in uh, Pakistan waiting for the war to start. Um, I've always been impatient, but I always also am incredibly competitive and I thought, what can I do that these 3,000 others won't? And so I put on a burqa and sneaked into Afghanistan ahead of the war and was there for two days and, and got some good material to write a story. But um, unfortunately, I was um, caught on the way back and done for by a rogue donkey. Mm -hmm. So you were actually captured by the Taliban? Yes, I was. Um, initially, they arrested me for illegally entering the country. And then they started to think that I was some sort of um, spy, some sort of G.I. Jane character. And they didn't recognize my accent, which is the north of England, near Scotland. And they must have assumed that we all spoke like the Queen, and um, of course we don't. So uh, they thought I was an American trying to speak English. <laughs> Did they have a translator? How were you? How were you guys communicating? Yes, um, <laughs> the doctor's son in Jalalabad had the misfortune to speak Pashto, Urdu, and English, so he was brought in to act as a translator during the interrogations. And uh, he was called Hamid. I've often wondered what happened to him. And he said to me, these people terrify me and they should terrify you. Will you please just answer their questions? Mm -hmm. And what, what, what kind of uh, questions were they, were they asking you? And where, where were the, uh, so you're a British journalist coming to get the story. So where, and the, so the British are there uh, at that time, the United States is there. They're all there fighting. Is that right? No, the fighting well, hadn't started at that point. There was the, the build up to the war, um, you know, as well, as we've seen from the scenes coming out of Kabul airport, it takes quite a while to get uh, people out in a major evacuation. It takes quite a lot of time as well to organize an invasion. And so um, the drums were beating to the war, but I was told by somebody in the military, it's probably not gonna start for at least another two weeks. And I only intended to be in Afghanistan for a couple of days so I thought I'll nip in and nip out before any bombs start dropping. Mm -hmm. And so what, what was the story headline that you were chasing? Um, it was really about people's hopes and expectations in Afghanistan. What became very clear 
uh, quite soon was that um, nobody had TV sets. Television was banned under the uh, Taliban and nobody had television sets in these rural areas where I was visiting. They uh, never saw the horrific events of 9-11 on, you know, they heard about it. They heard something bad had happened and a lot of people were killed, but they didn't see the graphic images that we saw every 15 minutes on our screen for uh, the next three, four weeks. It was just nonstop. I don't know if you remember or not, but it, mm -hmm. it was um, pretty full on. And so they knew that something bad had happened in America, but they couldn't understand what it had to do with them because there were no Taliban, no Afghans on the hijacked planes. Um, and and um, they said, if it is Osama bin Laden, well, you know, get him, but don't bother us. And it was, it was quite interesting, but also, um, I learned the character of the people. They were quite fearless. The women were incredibly strong. Um, I found some that had been educated in uh, schools under the Taliban. And I found one young girl who was training to be a doctor at um, a, a college um, for uh, medical students under the Taliban. So that started to put in some fracture lines that uh, Bush and Blair had uh, claimed, you know, this evil, brutal regime, they don't allow women to be educated. And, and I began to realize that there was a little bit of top spin on that and that women were educated, maybe not in some areas because of basic economics and no teaching, teachers available, but, um, you know, I did meet educated women out in the countryside. So it um, it was quite eye-opening. And the Taliban uh, weren't feared or hated by these people either. So that was interesting. All right, here, we're just trying to get to the truth. We've been getting a lot of requests to talk about this topic. And now somebody, your, your story is very interesting. We don't support any political party. We're not a part of... Uh, any tal uh, you know we don't know much about the Taliban are, are you a Taliban Taliban spokesperson <laughs> no and I'm not their poster girl and I'm not a fan of theirs but I do speak the truth and I can only speak as to what I have seen I can only speak from the facts that I have gleaned and you know I remember about 10 years ago being in Iran and some very senior government officials said, will you brief us about the Taliban? And this um, meeting room of about 30 very senior um, administrators from Tehran was sitting around. And I said to them, do you want the truth? And they said, of course we want the truth. I said, well, I'm warning you now, don't shoot the messenger because you're not going to like this. And I told them about my experience, and some of them were furious. And I said, you know, I asked you if you wanted the truth. And in some ways, I think, you know, if the Taliban had slapped me round, chopped off a hand, I'd be fated now from everywhere in the world. But uh, because they treated me well, and I had the temerity to come out and say they treated me with courtesy and respect. I have been verbally punched and kicked ever since. What happened now? So you, you're you get you're getting interrogated. How long were you were you um, in, were you imprisoned? How long were you now um, with them until you were set free? I was six days in Jalalabad at the intelligence headquarters, where I was uh, grilled every day. They never touched me, they never threatened me. Um, I was absolutely terrified because I had bought into the propaganda. And this is what I'd say to everyone who's listening here today. Where did you get your facts from? How did you form these opinions? 
because I was terrified. I just thought they're going to kill me. These men hate women. They brutalize, they torture, they're barbaric, they're primitive. And you know what? I don't want any of this to happen to me. Um, let's cut out the middleman and, and just put me against a wall and shoot me. So I adopted a risky strategy, which is I became the prisoner from hell. I spat at them, I swore at them, I threw things at them. Um, they walked out on the interrogations a couple of times because they couldn't handle me. And um, there was absolutely no bonding. So for anybody who's sitting there going, oh, Stockholm Syndrome, sorry, sorry, but there was mutual loathing and hatred between me and the uh, Taliban. And when they did release me on humanitarian grounds, I don't know who was happier, them or me, when I crossed into no man's land. And even as I crossed into no man's land, as I got out of the people carrier, I got out backwards because I thought, I'm going to keep my eye on this lot because as soon as I turn my back, they're going to shoot me. That's, you know, so I didn't trust them, give them one quarter right up until the point that they released me. And it was only as I started to walk across no man's land that I thought, oh, you know, um, they weren't that bad after all. But um, I look at the fear on people's faces in the airport in Kabul. I recognize that fear. That is how I felt for 11 days thinking, is this my last day? Are they going to kill me today? Are they going to torture me today? Is today the day they're going to brutalize me? So I recognize that fear, whether it, it's rooted in propaganda or a real lived experience, I don't know. But that fear is palpable and it's very real. Um, and, and the same, you know, it was for me, the fear was very real, but the, the, the fear was all up here. It was all manufactured up here through the propaganda that I had been fed over the years. Yeah. Many of us fall victim to that. You know, we're spoon fed with the media, the mainstream media gives us. And then we form, like you were saying, that's where we form our opinions from. So now you're seeing on firsthand basis, uh, you're seeing things because you're experiencing these things. So you're you're there. Um, what else do you remember that stood out? I, I heard something about that. You were seeing that they would not even look at you. They were looking here, there and everywhere. And you took you took that first as a sign of disrespect but or something like that uh, because you thought they were going to kill you. So they couldn't look at you. But later you found out that that was actually a sign of respect. I had a feeling of deja vu. I was reading a report from a TV journalist um, who was interviewing Sahail Shaheen, one of the Taliban spokesmen. And he, sh she wrote that it was um, a really creepy um, experience. She said, you know, she was looking at him and he was looking here, there, everywhere but at her. And that is exactly what they did with me. Well, in my western arrogance and ignorance i thought they can't look me straight in the eye because they feel so guilty they know that they're going to execute me and and they can't look me in the face when i told my first muslim audience some pashtuns in the crowd came over and said no 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 this is a sign of respect we don't stare at women, we avert our gaze, we don't, you know, it's rude in our culture to look at somebody. And uh, so I look back, you know, this meeting with the Taliban was a total clash of cultures. I knew about as much of their culture as they knew of mine, and it was a complete clash. Neither side understood each other. Um, there were some, looking back, some amusing moments. And, and um, I remember the third or the fourth day, they came in very, well, they were always very dour. 
but they came in and, and uh, through the translator, they said, you have lied to us. And I said, everything I have told you is the truth. No, no, um, you didn't tell us you had a daughter. And I said, but you never asked me if I had a daughter. But you said you were single. I said, I am single. Well, how can you have a daughter? <laughs> and I said, well, do you have the concept of divorce in your crazy world? And uh, one, you know, nodded his head brusquely. And I said, well, you know, um, my daughter's father lives there. I live here. Uh, we're finished. But, um, you know, we, we still keep in touch because of our daughter's sake. And the really angry looking one leant forward and, and through the translator said, well, why haven't you got married again? And I said, I have my own car. I have my own house. I have my own money. I have my own job. Why would I need a man? And it was as though I'd hit them with a cattle prod. They just sort of reeled at this and they got up and walked out in disgust. They couldn't, you know, they, they just wanted to get out of the room. They just um, couldn't, you know, understand me as much as I couldn't understand them. And um, whatever they thought of Western woman, they probably thought, my God, they're even worse than we could have imagined. Um, so as, as I say, it was a, a total clash. I suspect some of them are still being counseled from the experience. Wow. At what point were you given a copy of the Quran and how did that work? Was that like part of a negotiation? Look, we'll let you go if you look into Islam, if you read the Quran, or did they just let you go and say, hey, look into this book, look into Islam? What, how did that develop in this part of the story? Sorry. The sixth day in Jalalabad, they invited me to embrace Islam. And I said I couldn't uh, make such a life-changing decision. But did they, be, 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 sorry to uh, interject, but did they explain it to you or did they just invite it to you? Did they give you kind of like a, cr a crash course? Oh, well, uh, th this cleric who came in um, asked me what my religion was. And I just thought, oh, you know, I, this is the part where I'm going to be put up against a wall and shot. And I said, I'm a Christian. And he said, yes, but what sort of Christian? Are you a Roman Catholic? Are you a Protestant? And I said, I'm a Protestant from the Church of England. And he said, and what do you think of Islam? Well, in truth, I knew nothing about Islam. Um, I knew a little bit or thought I did. And, and that little bit that I knew was completely wrong anyway. And he said, what do you think of Islam? Oh, I said, it's wonderful. It's absolutely fantastic. And I went off in praise of this faith that I knew nothing about. And uh, he then said, yes, Islam is a beautiful religion and sat back. And I again interjected, I couldn't agree more. And I went off in praise again of Islam. And looking back, I must have really shown my ignorance because I said, do you know, I said, the people around here love their faith so much, they pray five times a day. I said, imagine that, five times a day. So you're, so, observing, you're, you're, you're observing people praying around you? Yeah. And Oh, yeah. Well, you know, as, as anyone will tell you who's who's been in prison, there's nothing to do. And so what you do is you count. You count 20 strides forward. You count 10 strides to the side. Then you look at how fast the fan rotates. Then you just count anything. You wow. know, you count two flies going up a wall. That's a, an event. Um, and, and, uh, and so... I heard this call to prayer um, and it was called five times a day. And I'm thinking, my goodness, you know, um, they're, they're really fanatics around here five times a day. And so this is what I was trying to convey to the cleric that the people around here are so into their religion. They pray five times a day, not realizing that it's obligatory. So, 
you know, when I got back to London, I thought about it. And because I had observed things and counted things and watched people, I realized that Islam was more than something that you pick up and put down after Friday prayers. It was the way you ate, the way you slept, the way you conduct yourself, uh, the way you behave, um, how you wear your clothes, your you know, just it, everything in their life seemed to be guided or influenced by Islam. Entering a room, Bismillah, um, leaving the room, um, listening to my questions, you know, various um, things would uh, would come out. And uh, so when I got back to London, I just thought, if I am going to report with any authority at all on the Muslim world, I've got to find out about this religion. I've made these guys a promise. Um, I've got this glaring or oh, this vacuum in my head about Islam. I really need to fill it. So I started reading the Holy Quran, which I found very easy, the English translation by Elias Ali. And it was very easy for me because I had been a Sunday school teacher, so I was well up on um, the Bible. So here in the Holy Quran, the same characters, the same prophets, the, all the same. Um, well, not all the same, but, you know, the same people were coming up. And so it was very easy for me to um, to go through and read it. And then I started reading supplementary literature, especially about um, the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, because uh, he was the only person in the uh, Quran that I, his, whose name I didn't recognize. And um, so I started reading about, um, about him. And I left it right to the end, you know, sort of doing everything in sequence. And I read the farewell message. I wished I'd read the farewell message first. In fact, I tell everybody, you want to know about Islam? Start from the end and then work. Uh, work backwards the farewell message was just an inspiration and it is so relevant today um, it could have been penned by somebody from the Black Lives Matter movement it could have been penned from any oppressed group it could have been penned by whoever wrote the UN Declaration of Human Rights uh, but it wasn't. It was uh, written by our beloved prophet, peace be upon him, um, you know, 1400 or so years ago. So uh, that was incredible. So after two years of studying Islam and reading the Quran, I embraced Islam and joined what I consider to be the biggest and the best family in the world. And like any large family, we're constantly at loggerheads, <laughs> and and um, but you know that that's uh, it really is an incredible faith, and the Taliban are now in a position where they can show how beautiful Islam is, or they can totally wreck find you know once and for all people's perceptions of islam and and reinforce those prejudices um that people hold against religion and against islam you're talking so they're about in a, a very very important position at the moment you know mm -hmm. the world is watching mm -hmm. and anything they do mm -hmm. when you found out the deep love and reverence that the Quran that Allah, God Almighty, references to Mary. There's a whole chapter, obviously, in the Quran named after Jesus' blessed mother, named chapter Maryam. Uh, the love that we have for Jesus, not as a God or a little son of God, but as one of the messengers of God, just like Abraham, Moses, 
Noah and all the other messengers that were sent, when you saw that there wasn't there was this commonality, you know, uh, which many Christians coming from the background you were at, you know, the belief in one and only one God, being morally upright, you know, being a good human being. When you saw, you know, many of those commonalities, was it much easier? you know, to accept submission and surrender, because that's what Islam obviously means, to acquire peace by submitting yourself to the owner of peace, the creator of heavens and earth. Was it a much easier, you know, uh, transition? I struggled at the concept of the Holy Trinity, God mm -hmm. the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And I reread the New Testament and went back to the Quran. Then I spoke to scholars because people knew that I was studying Islam. I was blessed uh, with all manner of um, uh, scholars. You know, I had access to right across the Middle East some great names. And um, but I then also went back and spoke to some Christian uh, theologians as well because I really struggled with the, whole, the concept of the Holy Trinity. And it was an ordinary brother who opened my eyes. And sometimes, you know, we look for an answer and we look at the stars and the moon and it's there in, in front of us and we just don't see it. And he said to me, why are you struggling? And I said, well, it's been drummed into my head from a kid. But God is the Father, God is the Son, God is the Holy Ghost. And I said, and, and uh, this is the, the Holy Trinity. And he said, right. He said, what relation is John the Baptist to Jesus? And I said, well, they're cousins. And he said, right. So when John the Baptist is praying to Allah or praying to God, he's saying, Uncle God. And I said, don't be so ridiculous. And he said, yeah. He said, but if you believed in the Holy Trinity, he said, then, then John the Baptist would be praying to Uncle God because, and, and that's when I realized, you know, you can't um, dilute Allah. He's one person or, or one being, one individual. And... Um, He's everything to the, the whole world, and he can't just be, right, this is the bit that's the ghost, this is the bit that's Jesus. And I suddenly realized, I started looking into it more, and, you know, a lot of uh, Christians from um, Palestine uh, were tortured during the Spanish Inquisition because... The, um, the they didn't believe in uh, the Holy Trinity. These are Christians you're talking about. Yes, uh -huh. it was never in their it was never in their core belief. These are the the first Christians in the world, really. You know, the the ones that came from the the land that Jesus walked through. So it was um, it was that that was quite interesting as well, and. Mm -hmm. um, and and the Christians in that part of the world, when they pray, they pray um, the same as we do, you know, uh, in uh, Sujud, and they uh, they pray like that mm. um, in total submission yeah. to the one God. So it it is quite um, it is quite interesting, and I think. Um, that you know maybe a student of comparative religions could um uh, could come up and and explain this better than i i just have you know i was i was a sunday school teacher but i wasn't a theologian um i wasn't a, a, a really in depth in the same way as i'm a muslim but i'm not a scholar or even a student of islam um i'm just you know 15 years old islamically the ludicrous idea of john the baptist praying sort of to uncle god just really it it was just so, so simple it just hit home and uh, as i say you know um most of us are not blessed with 
uh, the minds of great thinkers and great theologians and scholars. Um, but there's still a lot of wisdom out there. And, and as I say, can be staring us right in the face. So what advice do you have for other people who are out there who become victims of much of the hate propaganda and now they're listening to you and you asked a brilliant question, where are you getting your information from? So what advice would you give for people who they've been fed all of this stuff about Islam? You know, Islam oppresses women. Uh, Islam, you know, wants to, uh, you know, uh, wreak havoc on the earth. Islam this, Islam that. What advice do you have for people like that who are, t t you know, just sincerely, they want to know the truth, but they're just crippled by fear? Well, to all my sisters out there, whoever you are, wherever you are, um, know your Quran. Because if you know the Quran, then you know that the Holy Quran makes it crystal clear we women are equal in spirituality, worth, and education. And there isn't a man out there in the patriarchy, in misogyny, anywhere, who would challenge the word of God. So if you know your Quran, you know your rights and you can enforce them and insist upon them. And, and it is having the knowledge to be able to do this. So um, if you're being oppressed, it's not because of Islam. It's because the oppressor doesn't know his Islam. So would you recommend every politician, you know, every per Christian, anybody who's, you know, they're just like you struggling with the Trinity. And it often has me think of the story in the heart of Europe where you had where my ancestors, the roots are in Bosnia and you had what's called the Bogomils, those dear to God. They were Unitarian Christians and they also didn't believe in this Trinity. So there are so many people who struggle with that. This was the largest concentration of people in the heart of Europe that when Islam came, they already believed in Jesus, but as a messenger, just like you gave that example about the uh, the Palestinian, the Christians from that area who also didn't believe he was God and a literal son of God, but same thing happened here. So when Islam came, it fit like a glove, that pure monotheism, and they accepted it. And this is uh, why you have the Bosnians people there in this area in Bosnia. Uh, the pri primarily they're Muslims, those who have submitted to the one God. So there's a lot of people who can relate to that, what you say, what you went through. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, it's very important to promote interfaith and uh, refer to people of other faith um, as well, because, you know, we all pray to the one God. That's what unites us. And uh, just as I would say to all the brothers and sisters out there who may follow different schools of thought, who may follow um, certain paths, I would say forget all of our differences and focus on what unites us. And what unites us is the five pillars of Islam. It's not rocket science. It's, it's not, you don't have to be a great a theologian to be able to understand the five pillars of Islam. Keep it simple. Keep um, you know. Uh, keep focusing on what unites us rather than what divides us. What the lesson that we have learned by watching events in Afghanistan is: when you are united, you can do amazing things. But when you are fractured and divided, um, you will struggle. And I would point to Syria, a, a country which is in a desperate state, still in civil war. Um, so united we stand, divided we fall. Thank you very much. Is that also right behind you, a copy of the Quran? It is, yes. Yes, yes it is. Beautiful. Uh, thank you so much. So advice, read the Quran connect with the creator of the heavens and the earth and that's what you did you were sincere uh, let me ask you this last thing were you because i i often give this advice to people who are struggling something very simple just ask the creator alone just say guide me guide me guide me at any point did you within your heart did you ask did you did you ask the creator alone without any intermediary for guidance i talk to him all the time even now <laughs> And, um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, 
I've got a, a, a picture, not in this room, but with the 99 names of Allah. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a hundred and I often have dialogue and, and um, in private moments talk and, and, uh, and that's important to keep those channels open, obviously in prayer, but um, I also, you know, have these private moments as well where I'm talking to him uh, and, and asking, asking, usually asking for wisdom. Mm -hmm. Please give me some wisdom. All of us, all of us. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your story with us here on the Dean Show. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. And there you have it. We're trying to figure out because there's a lot of things happening out in the world and now they try to bring Islam into it. Islam does this, Islam does that, all the negative things. So now when people are adhering to Islam, you got the, not the subjugation or oppression of women, you got the liberation, you got people getting their rights, you got people living purpose. And that's when you experience solace. That's when you know that now you are on a goal and that goal is not to just build every house, acquire every position, make all the money, and now put all your chips in one basket for this life. No, Islam helps you to go ahead and prepare, not to just totally disattach from this life. We say give us the best in this life and the best in the hereafter. So I hope that you got to benefit because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to live a good, wholesome, righteous life, worshiping one and only God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the same God that Jesus worshipped, Moses, Abraham, and the last and final messenger sent to mankind, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon them all. So why would a woman like this, who's captured, and then given the Quran, looks into Islam, and then she ends up accepting it? There must be something there. So we invite you to read the Quran, look into Islam, and do the simplest thing that you could do. Ask within yourself, the creator of the heavens and earth, for guidance. Say, guide me, guide me, guide me. Why am I here? Where am I going when I die? If you're out there, put me on the way that's pleasing to you. And then, be sincere about it. Be courageous enough when the truth comes to accept it. We'll see you next time. Subscribe right now if you haven't already so we can go ahead and get more people to be aware of the program so more people can get exposed to the truth and benefit from much of these stories that we share because we're not just trying to share stories. Through these stories, we're trying to inspire and change lives for the better. So hit that notification bell, like, and we'll see you next time. Support us on our Patreon page. We'll see you here every week on The Dean Show. Until then, peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum.